Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Mark Wilkinson. Uh, I'm on staff here at WBC uh, through the bridge as a local uh, school chaplain. Uh, I hang out with Stan when I'm allowed to. We did have a walk together a while ago. Always a friend and happy to sub in uh, for him into a preaching slot every now and again. And I'm happy to serve in this way. Well, as we said earlier, well, here we are in lockdown 2.0, or is it 3.0 or whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I tell you, one thing I never thought I would see in my lifetime is an 8 p.m. curfew. I feel like I'm living through like World War II or something. I have to confess, I'd love to sneak out and go and have a look and see the nothingness, but you know, I'm a good boy, so I haven't done any of that. But I, I do know, I don't know about you, but last weekend when I was, we were watching this, was it last Sunday afternoon, we were watching uh, Daniel Andrews talk about this, I, I had a whole bunch of emotions, like I went into shock, I went to anger, I went to frustration, and I sort of quickly realised that these are just like, this is grief, I was feeling grief about what I'm about to lose. And we've all lost, well, all of us here in Victoria, blessings to all of you everywhere else in Australia and the world, but right here in Victoria, we're in lockdown. See, and I'm aware, some people have lost jobs. Some people have lost opportunities for jobs. We've lost a lot of social interaction. And I reckon it's really tough for people who live alone. And, and I feel for it. I feel for you, who you live alone, you're feeling lonely and isolated. But also, sort of the other side of it can be that there are people who are, who are sort of feeling constrained and trapped in a difficult family situation, and that's stressful as well. It can be tough for the old. I have a mother in an aged care facility. Thankfully, it's all been protected so far. But it's also tough for the young as well, those with school, those who thought that had certain dreams and expectations about what this school year was going to look like. I was, uh, I was um, looking at my Facebook feed during the week and I had a laugh when I saw this particular thing. The most useless purchase of 2019? A 2020 planner. <laughs> that made me laugh. And so I was looking for that and then this one made me laugh as well. And so it was like looking for some travel ideas for the weekend. Hmm, I think I might go and visit, uh, I think I might go and visit Jesse this week. Lynn, do you want to come? Oh, how about we go visit Mia? No, 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 we'll save that for next weekend. You know, we don't want to use it all at once, do we? I actually think it's actually important at this time of grief and loss that we actually have a laugh. And so uh, there's a few other things. Hopefully that helps you. And we hope and pray that this curse of coronavirus is healed and gone. But we will get through this season. And if we keep our ears and eyes open, God will teach us some new things, I'm sure. And I know it's only the start of August, but I want to give you a Christmas message. And the Christmas message is Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God is with us. God is with us. And God will be with you in this season. In these past three weeks, uh, Stan and Justin have been leading us through so far through this really important series of finding your fit. And so far, Stan led us through week one. It was like we're shaped by God and then shaped for a purpose in, the, in week two. You can go back and look at all these YouTubes uh, from last week. Uh, Justin, last week, Justin led us in number three, which was how to be ordinary and be great at it. And I don't know about you, but when I was watching that, I'm thinking, Justin, what do you know about being ordinary? You're one of the most extraordinary people I know. Your singing, your songwriting, your creativity, amazing. You're not ordinary, mate, but God bless you anyway. Hey, I do love a couple of things that he said that I wanted to draw attention to, which was that he talked about not trying to be strategic like John Maxwell, when you're not strategic like John Maxwell, and more, even more importantly, play basketball like Michael Jordan. Like, none of us can do that. I know as a young Christian leader, I got caught up with, uh, with trying to be like my mentor rather than trying to be like me, which was actually somewhat ridiculous because my mentor was six foot six and I'm five foot nothing. Anyway, but one of the things I, great things I had to learn, important things I had to learn, and this, this teaching is a part of that process, is that God wants me to be the Mark Wilkinson that he's created me to be. And he wants you to be the person he's created you to be. Now, I'm inspired by the, uh, the Apostle Paul. 
Uh, the concept the Apostle Paul used when he was writing to a bunch of people, of, of, uh, bunch of people uh, Christians at places like Ephesus. I love this letter, what we call Ephesians, because it doesn't so much dig, it's, it's more of a general letter. It's not a letter that addresses various issues. It's a letter that can go to anybody. Now, if you want to know more about that, speak to me in the after chat, and I'll uh, tell you why about that. But anyway, I love this little verse in what we call Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It's just talked about how we've been saved by grace. And then it goes on to say, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There's a couple of great and awesome things about that. We are God's handiwork. Uh, that, that word there, it can mean like masterpiece, like work of art. For the, we have a couple of artists in our church, which is awesome. And to, to think of the, of the great painting stuff that they do, work of art, well, we are God's work of art. Or if you're more of a writer, another translation has we are God's poem. You know, a beautiful, clever poem or something along those lines. I mean, when I think of that, I think of Man from Snowy River. What an awesome poem that that actually is. And so, but you, you're God's handiwork, you're God's work of art, you're God's poem. I mentioned earlier that I'm a school chaplain. We, Justin and I talked about that on the way in. And I can actually, I, every now and again, I have this sort of whole thing that happens to me, and it happened to me, 10 days ago, where I'm sort of, I was in sort of the area, the well-being hub where I sort of hang out, and we had just a few kids, we had about six kids at school that day, and um, we, none of them are children of essential workers, but they're all at-risk students. They're all there because home learning is really hard for them, for all sorts of various reasons, that I, I can't go into all the details of that. But I looked out on them, I just had this sort of thought afresh because of Ephesians 2.10. I looked out at them and thought, you each are unrepeatable miracles of God's creation. You are unrepeatable miracles of God's creation. Whatever their struggles, whatever their identity issues, it's unchanged. That This doesn't change. You are an unrepeatable miracle of God's creation, I thought. And you know what? Clearly, the same for you. Same for me. An unrepeatable miracle of God's creation. Say that to yourself. I am an unrepeatable miracle of God's creation. Some of you need to look in the mirror and say that on a day-to-day -day basis. It's so important that you understand that. You are unique and God has made you in a unique fashion. He determined what family you would be born into, thus what country you'd be born in and what time that you would be born. He determined your personality and abilities and the spiritual gifts that you have. And the things that you have, and he knows the things that you have a heart for, and he's allowed you to have certain experiences in your life. And we've just covered our SHAPE acronym, have we not? Spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. And Rick Warren was really clever when he, when he kind of did that little acronym there to help us to find our way into this. Now go back to... Uh, Ephesians 2.10, because the back half of that verse, it talked about how we're God's work of art, handiwork, but it also says that God's got some, something in mind for you. He's created you in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Have a look at that. He's got some things that He wants you to do, some good works for you to do. And more than that, He's actually prepared those in advance. He's got a plan. He's got an idea. He's purposed you for an idea of what it is that you should do. Ephesians 2.9, you don't get saved by doing your good works. That's purely by grace. We just sung that earlier in our, our service, didn't we? Amazing grace. It's purely by grace, but we're saved that we can then make an impact, that we can do things. We can save for good works. You know, what we've discovered over the journey is that the more you understand yourself and how God has shaped you, the more likely you find the most satisfying place to serve. It's going to be good for you. It's going to do good things in your soul as you start serving other people. Now, we can all move chairs, we can all wash dishes, etc., etc., and those things need to be done, and we do those things that are necessary to do. But if you understand the, the way that God has shaped you in your, for your Christian service, for your life service, you'll understand, and it'll be satisfying. God will bless you, and you'll be a blessing to others. And you'll make a contribution to Jesus. That's why I love this stuff. That's why when Stan asked me to preach on this stuff, it's absolutely bring it on. Very glad to do so. 
Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Way back 40 years ago, when I was first invited to be a youth leader, my dad was in charge of recruiting for all the, all the ministries from primary school to high school. It was a huge job to do as a layman. And he was sort of doing that in a, in a transition in, my, in our church life. And I remember he came to me and he said, okay, I've got a vacancy in year four and a vacancy in year nine. Which one do you want? I don't even think he asked me whether I wanted to serve. He just expected that I would serve. That's for another sermon. And I thought, well... Year nine had been like a really challenging year for me at school. Like really, really hard. And I had a great youth leader who supported me in that, in that time to help me through that process. And at the end of year nine, I gave my heart to Jesus. I went forward to church and it was a life-changing experience and my life destiny has changed ever since the end of year nine. So my experience of being in year nine gave me a great heart for year nine. And so, when my, so I said to my dad... I'd like to do year nine. And then I served in year nines. It was, you know, God confirmed that that's where he wanted me to be. And I served in year nine for seven of the next eight years. And that's where I started out on my journey of uh, pastoral, pastoral work. And I developed some gifts in preaching and leadership and wisdom that I was to use from there. If I go back, about, hmm, what are we now? 16 years. Coming back to Melbourne. Lynn and I had spent 15 years out of Melbourne, from the middle of 1989 to the, uh, to the middle of 2004. And we were, again, we were processing, we just, Jesse was just born, and we were processing where did God want us to be, and so on. I had various opportunities and possibilities in different states and different things, but I just had a heart to come back to Melbourne. It's like, it feels like, it, felt like, it still feels like the place I belong, the place that I'm supposed to be. It was sort of like, that was my heart. Now, I'm not sure that coming back to Melbourne was the greatest idea right now, but anyway, my heart doesn't change any of that, even in the midst of curfew. Now, the shape profile is something really useful. It's a really useful tool in determining where God wants you to serve. And I just want to commend it to you. If you haven't already in this series taken the time to start thinking about those things, then take some time this week. And I know there's some stuff in the small group material for those of you who are in small groups to be able to have a look at that and to start processing that and to see what it might look like for you. Now, when the Apostle Peter, he's the other big guy in the church, Paul Peter, he writes a letter to Christians who had dispersed what we would call now on our maps as modern-day Turkey, sort of southern region of Turkey. He writes a whole lot of practical stuff about living as Jesus followers. And towards the end of his first letter, what we call... First Peter, but what he would call just like practical stuff I'm writing to Christians, okay? But like when 1 Peter 4, uh, 10 and 11, he says this, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. He's just like, he's so excited, he just breaks out into praise. See, notice you, to serve with the strength God provides, not just in your own power. So whatever gift you've received, it's for there to serve. Whether, whether it is like, uh, and Stan told us like that a couple of weeks ago, we all get gifts from God, whether that's an ability, like a, a natural gift that you had from birth, whether it's like, you know, a gift like sport or music or painting or maths or writing or whatever those sort of natural capacities are. Or they are the abilities, or whether you have like the spiritual gift like intercession. You know, this, I love intercessors. People who have the spiritual capacity to pray. We need those in the church, don't we? People who just love to pray and take any opportunity to pray and pray longer and more intently. God has done something in their hearts and lives and God bless them where the church needs those people. Or the spiritual capacity to share your faith in Jesus. I love those people, you know, people who just sort of can walk up to strangers and start talking about Jesus. Or more than that, that they can make, just build relationships and just weave Jesus into that and, and people start responding. People with the gift of evangelism. Again, hallelujah, we need people like that in our, in our churches, a spiritual gift. But the instruction is, each of you should use whatever gift you've received 
to serve others. The purpose of the gift is to serve the community, both within the church community and outside the community. And the gifts are primarily to help other people. We've already mentioned Michael Jordan. In my view, and most people from my age, the greatest basketball player of all time. <laughs> I watched a documentary, and lots of other people watched a documentary about the last dance earlier. Uh, it was interesting to, to discover he actually made some sacrifice of some of his scoring potential. When he was a younger player, he actually scored more but he actually changed his game in order to serve his team, to bring other players into, the, into it, and that's when his team won championships. In early in his career, he won scoring titles. Later in his career, they won championships, and he figured out which was better. The most talented player on the team, the most talented player in the world, needed to learn to serve his team. Wow. We need to do that also. We bring our abilities, our gifts, our personality, our experience to serve. We all need to learn to serve. No one has all the gifts. No one has all the abilities. Some of us maybe get to be up front and be on your screens a little bit. That doesn't make us more important. It actually makes us more responsible. Look what Peter goes on to say. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. No pressure there, eh? That's a fair degree of responsibility right there. So my job today is not to waffle on and speak for my own entertainment to make myself look good. My job that I'm accountable for is to speak the very words of God. It's a serious responsibility. James, the brother of Jesus, said this about that as well. My dear brothers and sisters, don't be so eager to become a teacher uh, in the church since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. Whenever I think about this responsibility of the teacher, I think about when I was eight years old. When I was eight years old, I, see, I love football. I love AFL football. I already told you that in the, in the pre-chat. And there was a footballer uh, from Essendon, Stan's favourite team, by the name of Jeff Blethen. And uh, he wore glasses. And even then, most people who had short-sighted wore contact lenses. But he wore glasses. So I remember one day, I asked my older sister, what does he do when it rains? She said, without even a hint of a a smirk, they bring out uh, glasses with little windscreen wipers on them. Now, that actually seemed pretty reasonable to me. I thought that sounds sound like a good idea. And now, actually, now that I wear glasses, it actually seems all the more logical. Five years later, 1975, I'm now 13. I'm at school. I'm what year eight, and uh, there's another bloke, a bloke, bloke, bloke uh, from Carlton, comes along wearing glasses, and somebody at school says, "Well, what do they do when it rains?" And so I say, with all the authority that I can muster, because I know now, I've been told, I've been taught, they bring out sunglasses. They bring out glasses with little windscreen wipers on them. Now the laughter that you're having right now at home is the same laughter that they gave me at school. But, but, have a look at this. Glasses with windscreen wipers on them. Wiper glasses, you can buy them on Amazon.com, $9.99, and they come in assorted colours. I knew they existed, I was just 50 years too early. Now, if anyone speaks, they should, do, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. That's how preachers and teachers are to think. That's how small group leaders are to think. How youth leaders are to think. And even, uh, especially kids ministry leaders, eight-year-olds are impressionable. But it's even more than that. It's one, you can speak on behalf of God when you're in a one-to-one situation where you're helping and advising someone else. And all of us, In any of those situations, we take a harm. The call, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Take seriously that teaching, my brothers and sisters. Those who are called to speak are called to speak the very words of Jesus. Let's wrap up. Right now, 
serving at, at a church looks a lot different. There's no children's ministry workers in the ministry center. There's nobody to usher in uh, here today. There's actually only five people here as per the regulations. Those who would normally come up now and stum- come beside me on the instruments and you would see them around me are not, are not here. They're at home. They recorded this next song weeks ago. Two things, however, you can still do. Two important things. How you can serve. Firstly, in this lockdown period, serving might mean making a phone call, sending an SMS, or writing an email. Just checking in with someone and seeing how they're doing. It might mean having a walk with someone who lives within a five-kilometer radius of your house. There's an app for that. You can find that. Find out the parameters of where you can go five kilometers and still be legitimate. And then you can walk with one other person. You can do that. And you can check in and see how they're doing. And you can walk together. And secondly, serving later, where we can use all of the ways that God has shaped us. It is going to be different. We don't really know what it's going to to look like, but I think it is going to be different. But we'll still be able to use all the ways that God has shaped us to be serving later on. We'll have a whole new set of experiences to bring to the table because we've lived through this whole lockdown thing. But it will require people who are willing to serve to use their spiritual gifts and abilities, who will understand their personality, who have a heart to share and experiences to invest. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my dear brothers and sisters. Whether they're here watching this live, whether they're watching this later on, wherever in the world they happen to be watching this, Lord, I pray for them. I pray that they will know your presence with them. Thank you, Lord. We never have to ask you. We never have to pray, Lord, be with me, because you are already with us. Lord, what we need sometimes is the awareness that you are with us. And so, Lord, give us that awareness. Lord, thank you that we will get through this experience. And thank you that you will be with us through that. And we'll be able to serve you on the other side. And we pray this all in Jesus' name.